Heavenly Father, thank you for the understanding by your Spirit of the Gospel that we find in the Old Testament. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom of the Lord that shows us these things. We give you thanks. Amen. Most people, when they read the book of Zechariah, focus on a future Feast of Tabernacles that supposedly is going to occur in Jerusalem during the millennium. When the people of the nations will proceed to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Has anybody ever thought how many millions of people there might be in the world and how they could fit into the city of Jerusalem? An impossibility. They focus on the idea that the main feature ahead that they're interested in is the Feast of Tabernacles. When the neighbours will want to come up, that's not what the book of Zechariah is about. The book of Zechariah possibly is the most messianic of the Old Testament books. In the first chapter, of course, as usual, the prophet is speaking to the then, in this case, Judah, not Israel. Because the end of her captivity of 70 years had transpired and already some had returned from Babylon to the land that God had given them for then. And the temple had been commenced and just about finished. It concerned the rebuilding of the natural temple of Israel that had to be rebuilt and you read about it in other prophets. In the second chapter, verse 11, it says, many nations, many nations will come. But of course, they didn't come then, did they? There's no historical record in the scriptures or otherwise that people from many nations went to Jerusalem to the temple. So most everybody thinks, oh, that's going to happen in the millennium. When people from all over the world in the, the different nations who are still living will proceed to Jerusalem. I hope they have built a, a large airport. <laughs> well, it hasn't happened naturally for the simple reason that the prophet is beginning to show to the people there is much more ahead than a restoration of a natural land with a temple rebuilt. He immediately begins to focus on the spiritual and the fulfillment under the gospel. This occurs with all the prophets. Always there's a double barrel. First of all, the prophet is speaking to the people who then existed in Israel. And secondly, he always then turns to the spiritual fulfillment under the gospel, not in a millennium on earth. Of course, it's future in that regard because the gospel had not been preached. The gospel was never preached under the Old Testament regime. And so, concerning chapter 2, verse 11, and the many nations, it was in relation to the everlasting covenant of Jeremiah. God was going to give Israel an everlasting covenant. He did. Who is the high priest? Who is the good shepherd? Who is the one who brought the everlasting covenant? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to introduce the everlasting covenant 
first of all to the Israelites, but mainly to the Gentiles, because the Israelites benefited from the everlasting covenant until AD 70. Jesus brought in the everlasting covenant when he said, this is the new covenant in my blood at the Last Supper. And there were Christians, first of all, among Israel. They received the gospel first. They received it from the apostles, but it began to be preached by Jesus. He brought in the everlasting covenant. And who's the everlasting covenant to? Now, most people who go to church either have a mass or they celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion. Why are they doing this? They're, most, they're Gentiles. But they're all following the command of Jesus when at the Last Supper he said, Do this in remembrance of me until I come. So that's a belief that exists in every denomination and they are acknowledging the everlasting covenant. There's no Israelite in their meetings, none whatsoever. They're all Gentiles. So the benefit of the everlasting covenant was primarily to the Gentiles and we need to understand this. In chapter 2, verse 10, this is what the Lord says, I will come and dwell in the midst of you. That does not relate to the millennium. It's not a natural dwelling. If there are millions of Christians all over the earth, as they would be according to their belief, and Jesus Christ has returned, they say, to, is, to the land of Israel in Jerusalem, how can he be dwelling in the midst of everybody? He's speaking about a dwelling of the, by the Spirit of God. He's speaking about a spiritual kingdom over which he will rule. He is speaking in relation to what occurred by him as the Messiah when he was here on earth all those hundreds of years ago. He was the Messiah, the promised Messiah who came. There never has been and never will be the promise of the Messiah coming the second time. A Messiah's, the Messiah's coming involved Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed of our sins and iniquities. Every believer in the gospel understands that. That was why the Messiah came. So he will never come again just to rule on earth over an earthly kingdom. He has already come. Now when he says, I will come and dwell in the midst of you, he's speaking about his indwelling by the Spirit in his spirit, in the middle of the believers of the Ecclesia, the Church of Jesus Christ. So there already you have in that book a messianic promise that was fulfilled and never will be fulfilled again. It was fulfilled in the setting up of the Ecclesia or Church by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who's the foundation of the church. The disciples and the apostles did not build the ecclesia and do not build the ecclesia today. The disciples and apostles did not build the church and they do not build it today. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is still building his church. So then you come to chapter 3 of Zechariah, and I trust every one of you will read the book of Zechariah. Read it once, read it once, read it twice. Go through it thoroughly.
till you understand the main points about which the prophet is speaking in the scriptures. Without any theology from your churches, just look at the scriptures. And in chapter 3 it speaks of my servant, the branch. My servant is always the promised anointed one, the promised Christ in the Old Testament. He is my servant, says God. He comes as my servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is called the branch. In Isaiah 4.2 it says, The branch of the Lord is glorious. Jeremiah speaks of the branch being righteousness. In Isaiah 53, in relation to the growing up, it says, a root shall come out of his roots. A root out of the tribe of Judah shall come out of the roots that were there. And you can read more about that in the Old Testament. So in verse 10 of that chapter, it says, we can invite your neighbours. So everybody says, oh, during the millennium, we'll just invite our neighbours and they'll all come with, up with us to the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh no. Invite your neighbours means under the gospel. We spread the gospel news far and wide and it is to the Gentiles today. It was fulfilled in the setting up of the ecclesia or church by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who's the foundation of the church.